So our next uh, speaker is Mark Seeley, and Mark will be talking on the topic of recent precipitation history in the Minnesota River Basin. I think many of us know Mark. Uh, he's probably the most well-known faculty member on the St. Paul campus uh, throughout the state. A uh, little bit of a, a background. Uh, he uh, uh, serves as an extension climatologist and meteorologist with the University of Minnesota coordinating weather and climate educational programs of the National Weather Service, so State Climatology Office, and various state agencies. Received a BA at the University of California at Berkeley in political science, that's an interesting turn. Uh, moved towards meteorology at uh, Northern and Illinois University and a PhD in, in Nebraska. His uh, appointment is 20% to research and 80% extension. And as I said earlier, many of us uh, know me this morning, and for instance, he, he always Friday morning does his Minnesota Public Radio uh, morning edition where he has, um, reports on the weather as well as writing the Minnesota Weather Talk each week. And so uh, we know him well. He speaks to not only ag uh, groups, but youth groups, uh, the urban groups, and around the state. So Mark, we really appreciate your uh, taking the time to spend with us today. And we'll get you hooked up with this microphone as well. Good to be with you today. And uh, this is a very important topic, I think, for uh, all of us to consider. Uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm in an especially good mood today because I, uh, some of you know this, I've been fighting cancer for the last year and I had my checkup yesterday and I got a thumbs up from the doctor. So that's, uh, that's a good thing. So, uh, thank you. Uh, this topic, I'll try to stay on task with, uh, but you know, this topic, let's face it, it invokes a lot of uh, emotion. Uh, it's a, uh, it's, uh, been polarizing, especially in recent years. I'm going to do my best to give you the uh, climate science perspective this morning. I want to uh, also acknowledge that the perspective I'm giving you today is not mine alone. Uh, I've sat for over 30 years on the regional climate services and climate science committees, and what I'm going to try to express to you is a view from the climate science community. It's pretty much a consensus view. Uh, my colleagues in the Dakotas and Iowa, Wisconsin, Ontario, Manitoba, etc., we would all be on the same page in these views. So I'm not giving you a maverick view of climate science. I'm giving you a, a consensus view here. The other thing that I'll say at the outset is two bottom line messages, and I hope to illustrate these as I go is one, it's a disservice of modern science if we attack this problem of sediment in our Minnesota watersheds solely by looking at quantity shifts in precipitation. That is an oversimplification. There are other dimensions to climate and how it's changing and I'm going to illustrate those to you. There are other characteristics of precipitation that we ought to be paying attention to. Uh, the other uh, thing that I, that I want to mention to you is that uh, the uh, value in our network of the volunteer we have. We have over 1,500 volunteers in Minnesota who make uh, daily observations for us. And we are very, very blessed as a people to have that because there are many, many other states and many other countries that don't have that richness of data to look at. Flooding has been part of our history as far back as we can go. Uh, in my Minnesota Weather Almanac, which was published back in 2006, I went all the way back to 1807. Yes, indeed, we had records back to 1807. And throughout time, on most of our major watersheds, we have had some rather significant flooding. Flooding's been with us 
uh, in this landscape uh, all the way back to the Ice Ages. Uh, so it goes without saying that we have had, uh, and we have had embedded in that historical story is we've had some real societal responses to these floods. We have modified the landscape, we have modified our watersheds, we've done a lot across the generations to deal with this aspect of our climate. In the winter of 1880 and 81, which I write about in my book, for example, The Laura Ingalls Wilder Long Winter, we still to this day see that uh, in years where we have abundant snowfall, and yes indeed parts of southern Minnesota did have 110 to 120 inches of snowfall in the winter of 1880-81, uh, that when we have a level of winter like that and we migrate into spring, it's inevitable we're going to have floods. And even to this day the spring floods of 1881 are still landmark floods even in the modern context. The 5051 floods provoked a good deal of watershed management activity in the 1950s in our state. Again, they were fed by abundant uh, seasonal snowfall and combined with uh, a high level of precipitation. And then 6465, the winter of 6465, which I'm sure some of you in this room uh, lived through, again provoked quite a bit of attention to watershed management as uh, we had the, and still to this day on especially portions of the Mississippi Basin and also the Minnesota Basin, it was one of the landmark floods of the 20th century. Uh, our linear precipitation trends. Okay, talk about uh, the quantity shifts in precipitation. This is the 1895 to 2009 color-coded depiction of simple regression linear precipitation trends across the U.S. and you can see that it is widespread across the U.S. in the positive direction. Quantity shifts are widespread in the positive direction, color-coded here anywhere from uh, just two to five percent up to uh, over thirty percent in places. Um, the other aspect of this, and this is a generalization, but it's an important generalization. In the climate science and the climate change research communities, they acknowledge warming of our atmosphere increases the depth of the mixing layer in our troposphere. The troposphere is the lower layer of the atmosphere in meteorological terms but it's where all the action happens. It's where all the heat and moisture transfer occur. It's where all the cloud forms exist. It's where all the dynamics that give us weather happen. And as across time, the mean height of the troposphere with the warming at the surface that has occurred has increased across time. There's been a few negative deviations due to volcanic eruptions but for the most part, as we have warmed, the depth of mixing has warmed. This is an important background characteristic of the atmosphere. Like I said, it's a generalization, but let me give you a couple examples of what it translates to. What it translates to, uh, documented by Environment Canada meteorologists, is that in the higher latitude positions, you get a greater mixing depth in the summer especially, and this can be as high as 50 to 60 degrees north latitude in the northern hemisphere, and with that greater mixing depth you get a different cloud form. You get more convection, you get more vertical cloud form, you have a higher probability of the type of intense precipitation and thunderstorm activity that that greater mixing depth, that greater convective engine can deliver to the landscape. As a consequence of that, in June of 2007, Environment Canada reported the first ever F5 tornado in Canada. The convective energy was sufficient in June of 2007 to produce an F5, an Oklahoma or Texas scale tornado in Manitoba. The first time in history they've acknowledged that. 
I might also note down here further that more recently, just last year, up at Churchill, any of you been to Churchill on the southern edge of Hudson Bay, they had their all-time record daily precipitation amount. Again, the mixing depth, this is almost at, at uh, well, it's 59 north, folks. 59 degrees north latitude. They had enough vertical mixing. They had a thunderstorm fueled by the uh, water vapor off the Hudson Bay that delivered over four inches of rain in one day to Churchill, Manitoba. Broke their previous all-time record by nearly two inches for precipitation. So this background thing that's happening in terms of the increasing mixing depth of the atmosphere is an important attribute of change. What's happening in our region? And this gets back to the consensus view of regional climatologists. We do see temperatures are warming. We see temperatures are warming skewed to winter and skewed to nighttime minimums. We see water vapor as a whole is going upward. The water vapor content in the atmosphere around us and we see amplified precipitation signals all over the place. These are acknowledged going on not only in the Western Great Lakes region, I might uh, go on to say that among the climate community worldwide, we, we're seeing this all over the place in mid to high latitude positions. So you can find similar trends in Central Asia or Central Europe, or if you migrate to the Southern Hemisphere, you can also find uh, similar trends going on. Here's our statewide temperature trend, uh, merely to show the warming that's occurred, the consistent warming in, reflected in the mean annual temperature. Uh, that is pretty evident in all the uh, states that surround us as well. The seasonality of that is the characteristic signature I talked about related to winter. The December, January, Fe February signature of mean temperature is consistently above normal and amplified, especially in the context of history, whereas it is, it's definitely present in the spring and uh, it's, it's mixed in the fall and it's definitely mixed in the summer. But uh, the, the winter character to this is very, very evident when you look at the statistics. Also, if we look at trends in the uh, individual stations, we have uh, what's going on now, and this will come out next month. So we're right on the threshold of getting new normals. The, uh, all our frame of reference is based on some kind of a so-called normals period. By the way, that's mandated by the World Meteorological Organization. So we will migrate away from the 1971 to 2000 frame of reference. And beginning later next month, we'll call the 1981 to 2010 period our frame of reference. And as we migrate to that new frame of reference, we will see upward trends prevail in most all of the months of the year for most locations in our region. You will say that the base reference, whether you call it reference mean monthly temperature, reference mean nighttime temperature, or reference mean daytime temperature, we're going to, for the, for the most part, see those numbers migrate upward. That's an example at Waseca. As you can see, all months will be upward in the new normals, except for the month of May. And uh, similarly here over at Rochester, if we look at the Rochester minimum temperatures, you will see that for, uh, especially in the winter, the months of January, February, and March, they will be significantly migrating upward with respect to what we call average minimum temperature. And uh, we'll kind of lose that a little bit in terms of what's happened in our lifetime because all the daily reference will refer to the 81 to 2010 period and we'll more or less forget about what occurred before that. But we must realize that what occurred before that was dominantly cooler. Uh, so we have seen changes and you've heard me talk about this. The statistical evidence for these changes in climate has clearly manifested itself in the natural environment around us. And we do see that uh, lakes and soils are frozen for less periods of time in our winters. We see more rapid breakdown of crop residues because the temperatures have been warmer. 
uh, later fall nitrogen applications because the soils stay warmer later into the fall, et cetera, et cetera. We see all of this statistical evidence in the climate variables manifest itself in the real world <laughs> in these ways. And lots of other researchers have documented what all these different ways are. One that's killing us is the, uh, is the freeze-thaw cycle. We're having far more frequent freeze-thaw cycles in winter than we've seen in the past. Here's the summer depiction. I want to talk about water vapor for a minute because it does translate to what's happening in the Minnesota watershed. But I'm going to get there in kind of an obtuse way. I'm first going to show you here's summer, June, July, August temperature trend. And you can see that it's not nearly as dominant warm as the winter months, but it, nevertheless there is a warm signal embedded in that temperature trend. But if you look at the extreme daily values, they're downward. If you look at number of 95 degree days or number of 100 degree days like we had back on June 7th, that was quite a blip. We set records all over the place on June 7th. But, uh, but the frequency is downward. The extreme daytime frequency and temperature is downward. It's downward at almost any location you look at. And it's especially downward since the drought year of 1988. In the historical documents, the drought year of 88 is a spike. And then since that, it's, con it's especially consistently downward. Here's the rank of our last 18 growing seasons in terms of mean temperatures. If we looked at the mean temperature for May through September, all the way back to 1993, and we took the historical rank of that value, this number over here, we would see that distributionally, distributionally, the lion's share of our growing seasons have fallen in the warm part of the distribution. Number 71 here for the most recent growing season, 2010. But you can see we have had some cold ones. There's no question. We all remember how cold 1993 was. And we have had a few. So it's not uniform. It's not a, it's not a purely linear trend. But there's a dominance in terms of frequency of warm growing seasons. And then what I wanted to illustrate over here is a water vapor signal. Starting in 1995, all of these asterisk growing seasons, which you can see here, are frequent in number all the way through last year. We've had 80 degree dew points. Now, an 80 degree dew point is only a character of the modern era in Minnesota. It doesn't exist in our history. It's a, it's a Cancun, those of you that vacation in the winter, this is the analogy I use. That's Cancun, Mexico. That's like taking the air mass over Cancun, Mexico and transporting it up here over Minnesota when you get an 80 degree dew point. That's a lot of water vapor. And yet all those summers we've seen uh, dew points go that high. The linear trend is upward in these uh, high dew points. Uh, the frequencies are as is most things with climate, it's episodic in nature. But if we look at the background of these dew points, their frequency is up. And uh, what do they do? Well, the dew point, the water vapor in the air around us, represents a lot of latent energy. Those of you that have had physics understand that. And as such, it sets a floor for what the minimum temperature can fall to. Those of you that watch the nighttime uh, newscast, the nighttime weather, 10 o'clock, look what the dew point is. Whatever the dew point is, that the nighttime low is not going any lower than that. Because as it cools down to the dew point, you get uh, condensation and you get the latent heat released by the condensation of the water vapor and you get stabilizing of the, of the temperature. And so if we raise the dew point, we're going to raise the base value that those overnight lows can fall to. And then see, indeed, we see that reflected in some of the data. We see, for example, at St. Peter, an upward migration in the summertime minimum temperatures associated with this upward migration in dew point. Uh, we've got places where we record this routinely now, hour by hour, with the National Weather Service. And we see all these places in the state that have recorded 80 degree dew points since the mid 90s. And then we've had those stressful summer episodes where the heat index 
goes to 105 and the National Weather Service has to issue a heat advisory. That's the criteria for heat advisories released to us. And you can see we've had all these summers where the dew point has driven the heat index extraordinarily as high as 125. Um, and we've had summers where it's been as high as 125. Not because the air temperature has been so remarkably high, but we, because we've had dew points so high. So you take a 92 degree July day and you superimpose an 85 degree dew point and you got a 120 heat index. And that's very stressful. It's, 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 uh, it's something we're not used to. So across history, when we go back in time and we explore our history, we have documentation of heat waves in our state all through the course of time, but all the red colored years and summers are ones that were driven by dew point rather than air temperature. It's a little bit different. It's, a, it's still a heat wave. It's still an acknowledged heat wave, but it's driven by water vapor content rather than ambient air temperature. So we see with the higher water vapor content, we see an effect that manifests itself in different pathogens, insects, and microorganisms elevated water temperatures in our lakes, some public health implications, some livestock stress implications. Again, the way the statistics of the climate shift or trend plays out in the natural environment surfaces in all these ways. And we see that in the, in, in the environment around us. Now, having said that about water vapor, that sets up the nice transition into what's going on with precipitation. And I want to illustrate this by first talking about quantity, but then I want to talk about some of the other characteristics of precipitation. In terms of quantity, this is a depiction of our statewide precipitation network. And again, I would emphasize we are data rich in this arena because we have so many observers. But if we go back in time and we calculate a statewide uh, pooled average, we find that last year, for example, in 2010, was the first year all the way back to the late 19th century that our statewide average has exceeded 34 inches. So we'd have to say in, in terms of our pooled data, in our pooled climate data, last year was acknowledged statewide to be the wettest in history. And these are, you can see in recent decades that the population of extraordinarily high values, those certainly above the 75th percentile historically, the population is, is rather prolific. Uh, in fact, Jim Zanlo, our state climatologist, has calculated that using a running 30-year filter all the way back to the 19th century, Jim has found that uh, the 1980 to 20, uh, 2009 period for many, many areas in the state of Minnesota falls in the 95th to 99th percentile. In other words, if you, if you wanted to frame how wet those 30 years are in a historical context, look at the area of the landscape that's in the 95th to 99th percentile in these decades that you've been practicing, that you've been doing your, you've been doing your practices. Uh, and indeed, it's evident statistically when we look at the pooled uh, trend in statewide precipitation. The green is all the uh, above mean values, surplus. And again, you can see that uh, in terms of consistency in recent decades, it's been pretty consistent. The seasonality is mixed here. We see mixtures in the winter season a bit. Uh, we see dominance in the spring of, of uh, a wet regime. Uh, mixed in the summer, and then real dominance in the fall. A uh, dominance of surplus signals, uh, statistically speaking, in the fall season with respect to precipitation. So if we look at this, for example, regionally, and we dissect it down to Minnesota's climate divisions, we can look at Division 8 here, down in the area where we're meeting this morning. We can look at uh, Division 8 alone, and we see the signal here is rather amplified in recent uh, decades, as well as rather consistent. Uh, the seasonality 
is uh, a little bit more uh, signature in the spring and certainly uh, somewhat of a signature for surplus in the fall. Um, normals, the background normals. Uh, here's a migration of the background normals at Mankato since 1921. You can see there was a, a upward progression through the normals periods at Mankato, except for the 51 through 80 period where it retracted a little bit, but bear in mind the 51 through 80 period reflected the 1950s and 1970s drought years. And then since then it's been upward so that it's now fully 17% higher normal value than it once was back in the mid 20th century. Wasika is another one that's consistently upward in the background normals and up by 29% in the region. So what we call normal has risen by 29% uh, and continues to go up. Uh, Wilmer, again, uh, central Minnesota here now, but you can see the migration upward in the normals periods. It's not, uh, again, this is 28% at Wilmer, so it's fairly significant. This is not to say they're, not, they're all uniform because we can find locations where it's flat. The precipitation trend across the decades is flat or we can find individual stations that are even negative. But as I showed you in those graphics, uh, the pool data, when we pool all the regional data, it's clearly upward. So from a quantity standpoint, we can make the statistical argument that the trends are upward for uh, annual precipitation. But embedded in that signal are some other characteristics of precipitation that uh, Dr. Trenberth particularly has written about. And these are the intensity of the precipitation, the timing of the precipitation, and its implication on the annual hydrologic cycle. So there's three characteristics beyond a pure quantity shift in precipitation. There's three characteristics that they would argue we need to pay attention to because they have implications for the landscape. The timing of when that <clears throat> precipitation occurs, the intensity of that precipitation, and then the impact of that precipitation on the overall hydrologic cycle. When we look at the watershed, when we look at the soil water cycle, when we look at the consumption of that water, et cetera. So we need to give some attention to those. In his most recent publication, which I would encourage all of you to take a look at, it's in the current edition of Climate Research, he talks about all of these characteristics of uh, precipitation and how they're changing. He's got several illustrations from the upper Midwest as well as other regions. One of the implications with the, uh, is, is evident not only in the Western Great Lakes, but in all these landscape regions with the blue plus sign, and this was an analysis done in 2007, and that is, and I, you, many of you have heard me state this publicly, is once upon a time in Minnesota, the fraction of our precipitation that came from thunderstorms was anywhere from 58 to 62 percent. Commonly, 58 to 62 percent of our total annual precipitation was in the form of thunderstorm rains. Not true anymore. In recent decades, it's a bigger fraction. And it's a significantly bigger fraction. In fact, we've had some individual years, individual years in Minnesota, where fully 80% of our total annual precipitation came in the form of thunderstorms. And this is true not only in the Western Great Lakes climate, but this is true in all these other landscape regions as well. Uh, that is a whole new ball game because it amplifies the spatial disparity between point A and point B. If you're getting most of your precipitation in the form of thunderstorms, you're amplifying the local scale variability because we all know those stories translate to one area of the county getting inundated and another getting missed. And by the time you get to the end of the growing season, you have this huge disparity in how much precipitation occurred. So it amplifies the spatial variability in our precipitation. The second problematic feature of that is we get way too much too fast. 
We go way, way past the infiltration rates of our soils. We go way, way past what the landscape can, can tolerate. And so we get massive erosion events and we get other things like that. So this character shift in precipitation is, and I agree with Dr. Trenberth on this, an important character change in our precipitation. Uh, here's what's happening, and this is going to be released yet this summer. Those of you that follow the National Weather Service realize that the National Hydrology Center is just about to release this information. All the recurrence interval calculations for different levels of precipitation have all just recently been redone for our area. So that whereas once upon a time in Minnesota we got a two inch thunderstorm rain with a recurrence interval of once per year, the new calculations are going to show that the frequencies are upward. For example, these are all the frequencies for just the 20 year period from 1991 to 2010. But you can see for many, many of our observers, it easily exceeds the once per year historical recurrence interval. And uh, we've also had some rather heavy duty individual, uh, individual storms. Now, another characteristic is the timing. And this, I think, is also important for your consideration. Once upon a time in our state history, the singular greatest daily rainfall of the year would come in May, June, or July. That was true. That was absolutely true in our history. The single greatest rainfall of the year would typically come in May, June, or July. Again, there's been a shift in the modern era. In the modern era, we're getting the single greatest rainfall contribution of the year coming later on the calendar. In fact, look at the spike in August, look at the spike in September, and believe it or not, we've even had individual years where the single greatest thunderstorm rainfall of the year occurred in October. That late, that late on the calendar. So we're seeing a timing shift going on in the background of these climate trends as well. Here's a depiction, again, similar to the temperature one I showed you since 1993. Again, sta a statewide look at the statistics for the May through September precipitation levels on a statewide pooled uh, aggregate and the historical rank. And again, here you can see uh, last year, the year 2010, comes out on top, all, just under 25 inches statewide pool data, uh, even topping 1993. But you can see that in, in these growing seasons, we have had a lot of high numbers. We've also had some low ones. But for the most part, we've been dominated in a hist Again, this is just solely a historical context. We've been do uh, dominated since 1993 by growing seasons that have tended to be in the higher end of the historical distribution. Because of the thunderstorm signature, however, we've also seen drought surface on the Minnesota landscape with a great deal of frequency. In fact, if we go back uh, <clears throat> in recent years since 2005, since 2005 and even through last year, we had some individual counties in Minnesota that were so consistently missed relative to the precipitation pattern that they, according to the USDA drought monitor, at least for a time, they went into severe or extreme drought designation. Now last year, it had no agricultural impact because those counties happened to be Cook and Lake counties up on the north shore of Lake Superior. Those were the two counties that were in severe to extreme drought and the rest of the state was okay. But nevertheless, what worries me a little bit is that the consistency of these summers since 2005 is hard to find a historical analogy for. You step back through time, you almost have to go back to the summers of 1929 through 1934 to find a stamp of consistency. Remember how we said uh, climate occurs in episodes. So you get stuck in an episode and you may get a repeated pattern for a number of years. 
So it seems like since 2005 we've been stuck in that, uh, at least from the standpoint of thunderstorms missing or at least uh, having an implication for some counties in our state. The other thing Jim Zanlow, our state climatologist, points out is, and this is rather startling, these maps depict south, central, and southeastern Minnesota from the standpoint of uh, flash flooding. And here we see that since 2004, we've had three 1,000-year events. So, you know, that's like, uh, I suppose that's like, I don't know, Giles, maybe that's like going to the roulette table, you know, and hitting three times in a row, you put you know, whatever it is, I don't know. But we got uh, three 1,000 year events in South Central and Southeastern Minnesota since 2004. And they've all been destructive. They've all been uh, what we call recycled thunderstorms or what we call training thunderstorms where the thunderstorms regenerate over the same area of the landscape. And those 50,000 foot cloud tops just keep bursting right on top of the same area of the landscape and keep delivering a lot of precipitation. Uh, what's interesting is if we frame that in the context of the geologic record, this is a construction of a chart by our colleagues in the Department of Geology and Geo, oh, formerly Geology and Geophysics. Now, the Department of Earth Science at the University of Minnesota. And they used the stalagmite record in the Spring Valley Caves in southern Minnesota because there's a historical correlation to extreme rainfall events in terms of the mineral deposition in the stalagmites in the caves. There's a correlation with intense rainfall events. And as such, they've reconstructed the climate history of intense rainfall events back 3,000 years. And the frequency distributions they're looking at in terms of the 100-year occurrences is showing in the modern era, even in the modern era, we are high, extraordinarily high, even in the context of a 3,000-year time frame. So if we want to frame it in a broader time frame and go beyond the instrumental record, they make an argument for that. Now. The reason I think these additional attributes are problematic is uh, the following. I think the thunderstorm signal that is embedded in our precipitation variability translates to something like this, what we had in 2007. Here we are in August 2007. We're catching the second half of our growing season with 24 Minnesota counties marked by the red X designated by USDA as eligible for federal drought assistance. And all the documentation that's required for that, for those of you that don't understand it, you know, they look for 30% reduction in crop, they look for declining aquifers, they pull irrigation permits, they look for water rationing, they look for high fire danger, they look for all the manifestations of drought. And USDA secretary back then, Michael Johans, declared, okay, 24 counties, federal drought disaster. In the same month, FEMA looked at southeastern Minnesota due to one singular thunderstorm event and declared seven counties federal flood disaster. This is the only time in our state history that we've had polar opposite declared federal disasters. And we've had federal funds come to the state for state aid because of completely opposite federal disasters. If we continue this characteristic shift in our precipitation pattern, we may see this manifest itself in the future. It may no longer, we may, we may not be able to label it a singularity. Um, and of course it does huge destructive damage. So then we have real implications going on that translate to not only the quantity shift in precipitation, but in terms of the other character shifts, the thunderstorm change, the timing change, and then lastly, the one thing I didn't emphasize that I probably shouldn't have overlooked, and that is the shift in the hydrologic cycle. Our North Central River Forecast Center is really concerned about this because we're seeing the flood threats on our Minnesota watersheds as we come out of winter we're seeing a higher tendency to have a significant flood threat in the spring. 
And that story goes like this. You'll remember from the graphic that we have a significant upward trend in our fall precipitation regime. That is important from a timing standpoint because it's in the fall season that we recharge our soils. The fall precipitation recharges our soils. In that sense then, we have very consistently been recharging our soils and leaving little buffer space for the spring snowmelt runoff. We've been so consistently recharging our soils in the fall season that the snow that we accumulate on the surface of the frozen soil through the winter season has little where to go come spring except to run off, except to go in the watershed. So that hydrologic cycle characteristic of consistently recharging our soils in the fall is very important. It's very important when we think about the soil water cycle and managing that, and it's very important obviously to our regional hydrologists when they think about assessing what the impact of the spring snowmelt runoff season is going to be. Uh, and so that characteristic is another characteristic that goes beyond just looking at quantity shifts in precipitation and you look at timing and you look at implications for the soil water cycle. So I think those are very important to pay attention to. Uh, lastly, I just want to point out that with these new normals, I don't want us to lose sight of these background trends. I, I'm a little leery that once the new normals are published next month and everybody starts using them, our state agencies, our federal agencies, our news media, et cetera, that then we're going to forget about what happened. You know, we're going to say, oh, well, that's our new standard average. That's our, that's, that's our average. And we might underplay what's happened to us across the course of time. Our new normals will show upward trends for the most part in precipitation. They will show, here's the July maximum temperature. Look at this color coding here for about 10,000 US weather stations. Look what's happening to July maximum temperature throughout the Western Great Lakes and the central US. The trend is negative. The trend's negative. It's positive in other areas of the country. It's negative here in the central part of the country. But look at the trend for January minimum. Almost everybody except Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and a few places like that, the trend in, on January minimum in the new normals is all, is all positive. It's all upward. And so we're going to have those. So, Last slide here, uh, if you've been waiting to accept the notion that our climate is changing <laughs> until the day that you see pigs, pigs fly or rabbits fly, I would say go to the Cloud Appreciation Society and take a look at those cloud forms and that'll convince you that those clouds do exist and uh, that there is ample statistical evidence there is ample statistical evidence that our climate is measurably changing and there is ample evidence from other scientific circles, be they biology or the physical sciences, that those statistical changes in our climate are having consequence and they're having consequence right now. And so to ignore them is a mistake. I think to ignore them is a mistake. Uh, to the degree that you have been successful, if you represent an enterprise here that is, has operated for generations or years in the Minnesota River Valley, and you have been successful in coping with this changing climate, I applaud you. You deserve a standing ovation. But I don't think these changes are suddenly going to stop and we're going to go flat. I think the challenges are still going to be with us in the years ahead to understand these and understand these again beyond just quantity shifts in precipitation, understand the character shifts in precipitation too, and then to the degree that we can, and we can't always do this, but to the degree that we can to adjust for these. And so that's my uh, take on this for your discussion or thought purposes. And I thank you very much for inviting me today uh, and uh, look forward to the other discussions.
Thanks. We've got time for a couple of questions. Yes. Uh, everybody, or a lot of people saying that what people do are producing the climate change and the warming. What was the deal when the Vikings settled in Greenland and had farms <laughs> and stuff there 800 years ago? Yeah, yeah the, the, natural, the natural drivers of climate and climate variation are still very much in play. And in fact, they aren't obscured by us. I, I, those of you that have heard me speak about this know my position on this. I am willing to acknowledge that we contribute in some ways. We can't totally dismiss that we've changed the landscape. We can't totally dismiss that we've changed the composition of the atmosphere. And there are implications for those. But the operations, the natural drivers of our climate variation are present. And in any individual year, they can absolutely obscure everything else. Just like the 1991 Mount Pinatubo eruption did. It was such a dominant climate forcing mechanism in 1991. It really obscured almost all other influences. And it lasted for at least two years, if not three years, before it dampened out in terms of its hemispheric signal. So you still have those natural drivers that come into play. And it goes all the way back before the Viking era, and it goes all the way, you know, goes all the way back in time. Human beings have occupied this planet for about 150,000 years, at least in some kind of form where we've grown things for food, or we've, we've herded animals, or we've hunted animals, or we've... So four and a half a billion years of Earth history, we occupy about this much space. And uh, I think it's only in our lifetime that we're beginning to appreciate, yes, we do have an effect, and we need to better quantify that. There's better science out there yet to be spoken that will quantify what those effects are. But I think we still have a lot to learn in that area. Another question over there. Yeah, I was wondering where the average temperatures were taken for uh, Tarpley and the mean temperatures. I was told that a lot of times it's at airports or cities, and it's real common to drive out of Mankato and find the temperature on your pickup very three right. to five degrees. I've seen it even 10 oh, yeah. degrees. Yeah, you're right. We have two. Uh, there's no, actually three tiers of data. The uh, so-called automatic surface observing systems or automated weather observing systems do not go into the National Climatic Data Center calculations of normals. They're used operationally by meteorologists to adjust their forecasts and kind of monitor things. So all those airport sites that are totally automated that you're referring to, they're used dominantly by meteorologists to do the day-to-day -day weather but they're not represented in the background normals. Background normals have a two-tier uh, observing system. They have the cooperative weather network, which is mostly volunteers. Many of these are farmers, by the way. Some are water treatment plants, and some are dam tenders, and some are, anyway, they're people where we can have good coverage every day. And then embedded in that is a subset called the historical climate network, the HCNs for which uh, the, uh, a lot of the new numbers are calculated. And those are the places where we consider the data quality to be the best case scenario, because they've been well looked after. The surrounding landscape has changed little across the generations. And so their numbers are used even more prolifically than some of the other numbers. And of course, the densities vary. That's the other thing, too, is when we extrapolate spatially, we have to bear in mind there are certain regions of the state, not so much south central Minnesota, but there are certain regions of the state where we spatially extrapolate these normals, but we may have like four or five stations to represent, you know, umpteen thousand square miles. And we have to acknowledge that, that might, there might be some disparity in the representativeness of these normals geographically. That, th those are all valid points. The laws, Ellen, Ellen, the Ninos, and what are they doing? The why, what? And why, why are we using the El Nino things now that we never knew about? Are they just that we've learned? Well, why them? use El Nino, La Nina, uh, and this will be, I'll stop. 
the 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 uh, the, El, the El Nino La Nina uh, uh, climate signal in the equatorial Pacific. That is, it's a coupled signal. Those of you that have read about it, between sea surface temperature and the pressure of the overlying atmosphere. There are seasonal shifts in those patterns, and they're coupled. The sea surface temperature is coupled with the air pressure pattern. And when they're in, the reason we keep hearing about them is when they're in play, and you know they're not in play all the time. Sometimes we're in a neutral state, which is what we're in right now. But when they're in play, there's historical correlation to certain weather patterns. Not on all continents, not during all seasons, but on some continents in some seasons, there's historical correlations. So it gives our meteorologists a lever or a tool to use to do a better job of seasonal forecasting. So it's in the tool kit when it's present because it has a historical correlation. But it's not a perfect correlation. It's not, uh, it's not like the perfect cor you know, it's not like the perfect correlation of Joe Maurer every time he comes off the disabled list getting a hit his first time at bat. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's more like, you know, these historical correlations are more like a 60 or 70 percent probability. It's not a 100 percent probability. But, okay, well, thanks very much. Another